Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History's 20th Century Style Icon Series. In this episode, to mark the 20th anniversary of her very sad and untimely passing, we're going to be looking at the girl who was once known as Lady Diana. Diana has been suggested to me more times than anybody else as a potential 20th century style icon here on the UFH, and thank you to everybody who suggested her. But I always shied away from covering Diana. Why? Well, when it comes to 20th century style icons, it's sort of like looking at the sun. You daren't do it. For 17 years, we watched her style evolve becoming increasingly sophisticated, elegant. This incredible alas she had, her wonderful, confident relationship with fashion has been discussed so much. What did I have left to say? I realized I needed an angle to discuss Diana. And you may have noticed that the title of this episode isn't Princess Diana, it's Lady Diana. This girl we first met in 1980 wearing this diaphanous skirt. The minute we saw this picture, I think we all sort of knew that fashion was going to be a big part of her story. And she had a very distinctive look. But it wasn't an original look. No, indeed. When we first met the young Diana, she was dressing exactly the same as every other young woman in her tribe. So I'm going to discuss Diana as the optic through which to talk about Sloan Rangers. Now, those of you in England probably know what a Sloan Ranger is. And those of you who were old enough to remember when we first met Diana, you'll probably remember that this was our first introduction to the Sloan Ranger. But for those of you who are perhaps a little bit younger and maybe not English, let me explain who the Sloan Rangers were. Sloan Rangers were so called because they congregated around Sloan Square in London. They shared flats in posh boroughs like Kensington, Chelsea and Knightsbridge. Female Sloanies, as they were known, often worked as nannies for other posh families or perhaps PAs in the city. Their male counterparts were often known as Hooray Henrys. They worked in the city, sometimes they were in the military, sometimes they worked for daddy's company. Uh, here they are wearing regatta stripes. Often Hooray Henrys were not that well behaved and would often get into rowdy trouble after too many pims, which these boys are drinking here. But of course, real home was mummy and daddy's country estate, or at least big house in the country. So it was this very town and country life. These were young people who held on to quite traditional values, this sort of old fashioned, upper crust, upper class English way of life. Some of them were indeed minor royalty like Lady Diana Spencer, and many were just very affluent, privileged young people who all went to the right public school and they all stuck together in this pack, in this tribe the Sloan Rangers. Sloan Rangers were a cultural phenomenon in England in the 1980s. Of course, there was the Sloan Ranger handbook by Anne Barr and Peter York that poked affectionate fun at the Sloanies. The Sloan Ranger handbook, of course, was a bit like the preppy handbook over here in America in the 80s. And indeed, there are parallels between the Sloanies and the preppies, just as there are parallels between the Sloanies, the preppies and the BCBG crowd in in France. And of course, they had the right uniform. The object of being a Sloney was to dress identically to the Sloney you shared a flat with or the Sloney you were going to a party with. It was all about identifying, identifying with your own social class. Here, as illustrated in the Sloan Ranger handbook, you have the typical Sloney city outfit. And here, the country togs. And sometimes elements from the country wardrobe would overlap into the city wardrobe and vice versa. 
Sloan Rangers were instantly recognisable during the 80s in England and often made fun of like in this Heineken ad where this Sloanie is given a Heineken and I think she quite likes it. But please note how she's dressed with that high ruffled pie crust blouse, the string of pearls, the Alice band, the tiny little earrings. And no doubt she is saying, OK, ya." OK, ya was the catchphrase of the Sloanies, often heard at the White Horse, their favourite pub, also known as the Sloney Pony, where they would sit around drinking gin and slim, their favourite drink, gin and slimline tonic, diet tonic. I say, Caroline, do you fancy a gin and slim at the Sloney Pony? OK, ya. They really were made fun of, but they were very proud to be Sloanies. I have to make that point. They were very aware of what they were doing. The designer of choice for every Sloan girl was Laura Ashley. This was a big moment for Laura Ashley. A lot of these rather nostalgic looking print dresses with dropped waists and big sailor collars. It was all very traditional, very frilly, very ladylike. You simply could not be a Sloan Ranger without Laura Ashley. And Lady Diana was no exception. She had a lot of Laura Ashley in her early wardrobe. And talk about those tall, pie crust, frilly collars. But none of this was unique to Diana. Take a look at her here with her pie crust collar and sensible jumper. And then look at the girls around her. They're all sort of drawing from the same fashion aesthetic, aren't they? Of course they are. They're all Sloanies. The idea of having a house in the country or an estate in the country was very dear to the hearts of the Sloanies, as most of them did. And so it's no surprise that labels like Burberry and Barble were so close to their hearts. A lot of khaki, a lot of padded jackets, padded vests, stuff like this, wellies. Of course, you needed your wellies because the idea was that you were sensible. You liked country living. You would be walking your dogs. You'd be riding your horses. And then you might even pop up to town for a quick shop at Laura Ashley or Peter Jones. But, oh my goodness, you didn't have time to take your wellies off. And there's Diana in her wellies. Tweed, a lot of tartan, a lot of tweed. And there, of course, is Diana in one of her most famous outfits during her honeymoon by Bill Pashley, I believe. And here it is, that very suit. And there she is in her barbour outdoor coat with a Range Rover behind her. That was the country vehicle of choice for the Sloan Ranger. And even though they could afford to drive very nice little sports cars in London, they didn't. They often drove small second-hand minis, things like that. Sensible, you see. There was really something sensible about the Sloan Ranger. There's something about the British upper classes, in fact, that kind of revel in cutting corners when it comes to unnecessary luxury. So let's do a complete anatomy of the typical Sloan Ranger wardrobe circa 1980-81. Starts off with sensible underwear from Marks and Spencers. This is important. Then Dior stockings. You see, not all of your undergarments were supposed to be practical. No, your Dior tights showed that you had money. Then, of course, your calf-length Laura Ashley ruffled skirt, ruffled blouse, usually with a pie-crust collar, over which you had a sensible Marks and Sparks v-neck sweater, often from the menswear department. The ubiquitous string of pearls. Then, your barbour padded vest, because you were a country girl at heart, and you might be running home to mummy and daddy's country estate as soon as you'd got off work as a PA in the city. Shoes, either Russell and Bromley sensible flats or Bally shoes with a little heel, although if you were going out, you would wear Gucci flats with that big emblem, that big gold medallion on them tapestry bag and then we just have to put Diana's pretty head on the top and we can see 
She was an absolute Sloane clone. She was dressing the way she was supposed to dress for a girl of her age from her social class. And there she is again with her sensible Marks and Spencers V-neck menswear sweater, Laura Ashley skirt, frilly pie crust collar. And there she is again, plaid skirt, sensible jumper with the turtleneck underneath. She really was part of that tribe. And what I find so interesting and what I love about London is this. OK, here is a map of the King's Road with Sloane Square there on the right. In the centre is Peter Jones, a department store that was very favoured by the Sloanies. And the King's Road, Sloane Square, Cadogan Place, all of this area was, of course, the Sloan Ranger stomping ground, but in the early 1980s, it was also the stomping ground of the New Romantics. It's so extraordinary, these two utterly identifiable and quite hermetic tribes absolutely coexisted with no problem whatsoever. That's one of the things that I really love about the English. We're so eccentric that we don't mind other people being just as eccentric as we are. If you would like to learn more about the New Romantics, oh yes, there's an Ultimate Fashion History special on them. Now, these girls aren't Sloan Rangers, but they've taken certain elements of Sloany style, haven't they? How come? Well, because of Diana. If you didn't live in London or in the home counties, which is what we call the, the counties around London, in the late 1970s, you really weren't exposed to Sloanies or Sloany style. If you lived in Plymouth or you lived in Durham or Liverpool, you didn't have a lot of Sloanies running around. It took Diana to introduce Sloany style to the rest of the country, indeed, the rest of the world. If you're too young to have been there and experienced this yourself, take it from me. Diana was a huge fashion influence. How to get the Lady Di look. What they're really saying here is how to get the Sloan Ranger look. Please dye my hair. Royal Bride starts a fashion wave. And she certainly did. Now you can look like Lady Di. We like her style. All of these Sloany elements Diana was given credit for inventing, but in fact she didn't. She was just doing what she was supposed to do, dressing the way she was supposed to dress. And speaking of dresses, nearly everything she wore got knocked off. Like her famous engagement announcement blue suit. My goodness, there were a million versions of this suit. She was the fairy tale princess, Cinderella come to life. No wonder the whole world bought into this supposed romance. When the world first met Diana, she was 19 years old, the same age as the girls that I teach, and was every bit as innocent as they are, and as trusting as they are, and as optimistic as they are. And it's been said of Diana, oh well, she didn't follow the rules. Well, she didn't even know there was a game. And she certainly did follow the rules when we first met her, and that comes down to fashion rules. She wore absolutely what an upper-class girl of her age was supposed to wear. And what I find really interesting about Diana's personal style is that you really see that moment when she breaks away from tradition, when she starts breaking the rules, all of the rules, including fashion's rules, eschewing those fashion rules and that Burberry, Barbour, Laura Ashley, Ralph Lauren uniform, beloved of her peers, Diana emerged as truly a fashion goddess with her elegant style, those little touches that are all her own, that graceful elan she had, that confidence with clothing, her eye for palette, her attention to detail. She took fashion risks. Sometimes they didn't work out, but 99% of the time they did. And I think it's so interesting to see this evolution from that pretty young girl we first met in that lavender Sloney uniform 
to the absolute fashion icon she eventually became. Because what makes somebody a true style icon is originality and confidence. And Diana had it both in spades, at least in terms of her relationship with fashion. So here's the irony detection meter, and you see the finger is going off the scale because, ironically, although Lady Di was the absolute poster girl of the Sloan Ranger, she was the opposite. You see, the whole ethos behind Sloan Rangerism was tradition, to do what was expected, to do what was proper. Basically, keep calm and carry on, no matter what. If your husband runs off with your nanny, it's all right as long as you get to keep the house in the country and you have your dogs. You don't talk about your feelings, you keep them all bottled up in that upper-class, suppressed kind of way, and you tie your headscarf even tighter under your chin as you treat yourself to a shopping spree at Peter Jones. Diana wasn't like that. She divorced her philandering husband. She talked about her feelings, and by doing so, she was speaking to so many people who may be feeling the same things she was feeling. She did things her own way. She raised her children her own way. And that included trips to McDonald's. She did things people didn't want her to do, like getting up close and personal with AIDS patients, walking through landmine fields. She was pretty much the opposite to any Sloan Ranger I ever met, that's for sure. From that 19-year-old girl who just did what everybody told her to do, God love her, she really became her own woman, breaking away from not only Sloan tradition, but royal tradition. Diana had integrity. She was a true original. In August 1997, I remember waking up one morning, turning on the radio, BBC Radio 2, which I listened to a lot in those days, and fashion designer Jeff Banks was on the radio talking about somebody who had obviously died. And I remember him saying something like, from that moment we first saw her in that transparent skirt, we knew dot, dot, dot. And I remember thinking, well, who's he talking about? And having this feeling, well, the only person I can think of who wore a transparent skirt famously is Diana, but of course it can't be her. And then the news reporter came back on and said, for those of you who are just joining us, I regret to inform you that Princess Diana has been killed. I feel quite emotional now, actually, thinking about that moment. It was so shocking, so sad, so surreal, so unbelievable. And I certainly wasn't the only person who felt that way. This absolute sea of flowers outside of Kensington Palace in the days after her death. And although I can't possibly tell you which one it is, one of those bouquets is from me. Diana was four years older than me. And so it seemed that from the point that I was a teenager to the point that I was in my 30s, Diana had always been part of our cultural landscape. So much of what she had experienced, so many of us had experienced. Insecurities about our looks, about our weight, infidelity, heartbreak, so much of what Diana spoke about so openly and so warmly resonated with so many women of her age all around the world that I think we really did feel as if we'd lost a friend or at the very least a champion. This beautiful woman was so much more than a 20th century style icon, and 20 years after her passing, I feel pretty lucky that we got to share the planet with her for a while. I hope you've enjoyed this episode on The Ultimate Fashion History. You can contact me through my website, amandahalley.com. Like us on Facebook, as they say. Better yet, join our Facebook group. We always have loads of fun over there. Stay up to date with new episodes. Simply click the little bell under the channel art, then click send me notifications because I'm back every week with new episodes. But first, you have to click that little circle to subscribe. And as always, thanks ever so much for watching. Bye for now. <music>